Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please make sure to stay connected and let us know what you like. Today we will start with this amazing ship. This is the Sanger space plane, often referred to as the Silver Vogel or Silverbird, one of the first theoretical designs for a rocket-powered space plane. This concept was developed in Germany during the 1930s and 40s by the aerospace engineer Eugene Sanger. Sanger was a pioneering spaceflight theorist and with his partner, mathematician Irene Brett, had been working at the aerospace company Junkers, which at that time was one of the leading aircraft manufacturers in Germany. He worked on aircraft engines and rocket propulsion systems and then took some time off traveling to Austria to work independently on writing a book on rocket engineering that was published in 1933. It was here that he worked on one of his own ideas that became the concept of one of the first space planes. Here are some key aspects of the Sanger space plane. The Sanger space plane was designed as a bomber that could reach intercontinental distances. The idea was for the plane to ascend to the edge of space and then glide back down to its target, effectively using a suborbital trajectory. This would allow it to deliver bombs over vast distances, far beyond what was possible with the aircraft of that era. The design proposed the use of a rocket engine for propulsion. It was a two-stage design, but would be launched from a long rail, making kind of a three-stage system. Some of you may remember this lesson on rail launch systems. On release, the two stages climbed to a high altitude powered by the first stage. Then the second stage would separate and go into space and perhaps orbit, where it could launch satellites or drop bombs on an enemy nation. Then it would enter a long, flat glide back to Earth. One of the most innovative aspects of the design was its reusability, which was quite ahead of its time. Then the war came, and theoretical long-range bombers became a matter of real survival. But the technological and material challenges of the time made the construction of such a spacecraft impractical. The extreme temperatures and stresses associated with re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at high speeds were beyond the capabilities of the materials and engineering knowledge of that era. Sanger worked on more practical aspects of military aviation. And as the war was lost by Germany and the country divided, Sanger moved to France at the invitation of the Allied forces, who wanted to benefit from Germany's advanced aerospace knowledge. Later, he came back to what had become West Germany and was instrumental in the development of space technology there, advocating for European cooperation in space research and exploration. While the Sanger space plane was never built, its concepts and designs had a significant influence on later aerospace projects. The idea of a reusable space plane would resurface decades later in the form of the American dinosaur. And when the United States was going through an energy crisis in the 1970s, it spent the equivalent of half a billion dollars looking back at these designs and came up with the Star Raker space plane. Hydrogen powered, it was designed to take large solar power satellites to orbit. But after the crisis resolved, these plans were shelved. The German company Messerschmitt resumed work on the concept in the 1980s. And Germany's Aerospace Center, the DLR, which stands for Deutsches Zentrum für Luft- und Raumfahrt. That was my German friend Sebastian, by the way. Thank you, Sebastian. The DLR liked the Sanger 1 concept, designing a reusable launch system that became known as Sanger 2. This could also be used as a hypersonic passenger transport. The second stage would have been called Horus, for hypersonic orbital upper stage, a very cool name, as well as a cargo module that would have been called Cargus, a not so cool name. The Germans were adopting the American love of acronyms, but like American beer, it wasn't quite there. The reusable Sanger II space plane should have been able to reduce launch costs from about $7,500 per kilogram to less than $1,000. In June of 1985, the new concept was shown to the European Space Agency. By then, the ESA had three projects it was considering. Hermes, which looks a lot like the American dinosaur concept, and Hotol, a precursor to Skylon, which we covered in this lesson. 
The West German government agreed to provide $122 million, 7% of its space budget. The DLR itself kicked in another $48 million, while the German Research Society gave $17 million and private German industry another $22 million. In August of 1988, the first configuration was completed. The Sanger was designed to be a hypersonic aircraft about the size of a Boeing 747. It would take off like a conventional aircraft, unlike Sanger's rail-launched original design, with the first stage being powered by six hybrid turbo ramjets, somewhat similar to the engines used on the American SR-71. It would reach a cruising speed of Mach 4.4 with a maximum of Mach 6, and had a range of 11,000 kilometers, carrying 230 passengers for point-to-point -point travel. For orbital launches, the mothership would have been paired with an air-launched orbital space plane. This would have been derived from the planned Horus space plane. Horus was 31 meters long and 12 meters wide. Could have carried up to 2.5 metric tons and 6 astronauts to a 425 kilometer orbit, making it capable of easily reaching the International Space Station. Additional upper stages, like the Cargus stage vehicle, could have carried up to 15 tons to low Earth orbit. Cargus would have used some propulsion systems from the Ariane 5 rocket system for orbital flights. The Sanger would have climbed to an altitude of 30 kilometers and a velocity of Mach 6, at which point it would release the orbital second stage. Later designs would have reached Mach 7 before separation. The U.S. had proven the feasibility of an orbital space plane with the shuttle, but had failed to make it affordable or safe. The side attachment vertical launch design was inherently dangerous, obviating any early escape options and leaving the orbital vulnerable to falling insulation and ice, something that doomed the Columbia spacecraft. The Sanger designs were all valid concepts, but the greatest threat to the dreams of European space enthusiasts is the same in the United States, governmental short-sightedness. The ESA failed to develop any of these three concepts focusing instead on their existing systems, like the Ariane 5, which was a fine rocket system when it was designed back in the late 1990s. And while China is working on the Super Heavy Lift Long March 9, and America is test flying the SpaceX Starship, Europe is focusing on the Ariane 6. Let's look at the great progress made between these two rockets. The Ariane 6 is a maximum of 63 meters tall instead of 52. It's the same diameter, 5.4 meters, and can have a heavier gross mass, 860 metric tons instead of 777. Instead of two very large boosters, it can have two to four smaller ones. And it has a similar core stage, powered by the Volcane 2.1. The 2.1 is a simplified version of the Volcane 2, with very similar performance and mass. The Ariane 6 will not have a reusable booster like the Falcon 9 or New Glenn. The main selling point of this fully disposable design is that it will cost 44% less than Ariane 5, but that will still come in at about $4,700 per kilogram, while only getting an extra one metric ton to low Earth orbit. This is somehow considered progress by the European Space Agency. Ariane 6 is nowhere near the Falcon 9, which is at $2,700 per kilogram, to say nothing of the Falcon Heavy at about $1,500. And if the Starship succeeds, high mass to orbit costs will be completely reset. Where does this leave Europe? Far behind the rest of the world by any measure. China already flew the first methane rocket to space. That's right. Starship Integrated Flight Test 2 was the second methane-powered rocket to cross the Kármán line. And the Chinese are already flying and landing boosters. The ULA Vulcan rocket system is about to launch and can get over 27 metric tons to low Earth orbit. And if all goes well for Blue Origin, the New Glenn rocket will lift 45 metric tons to LEO. Ariane 6 will be obsolete before it takes its first flight. But what about safety for crewed flights? Right now, America has the Dragon 2 capsule flying, with the unreliable Starliner probably permanently grounded. And we also have the Lunar Return-capable Orion. 
Russia has the venerable Soyuz spacecraft and was planning to work on the Orel, but they found another way to spend their national treasure. China has the Xinzhou while working on something newer, and India is working on the Gaganyan. And Europe is working on nothing really. The largest economic bloc on Earth is not even competing in what will become the new frontier. How would someone compete with Starship? Is there any design intrinsically safer? In fact, there is. As made clear in this lesson, horizontal takeoff and landing spacecraft will always have a safety margin over vertical launch and landing spacecraft. And while the world was looking elsewhere, a German company named Polaris brought back the dream of a European space plane in 2019. Building on over 30 years of research, Chief Executive Officer Alexander Kopp who had worked with the DLR's Aerospace Division, took advantage of the ESA-funded Resolve study that was investigating future reusable launch vehicles with support from the DLR. The study focused on winged launch vehicles for horizontal or vertical takeoff and landing. The first test article was a 2.5 meter long subscale demonstrator called Stella. Stella is modeled on a planned much larger Aurora orbital space plane. That's right, the CIA cannot copyright something they don't admit exists. Stella had kerosene-powered turbojet engines and was used to perfect autonomous software for takeoff, subsonic flight, and landing. In 2021, Polaris received a contract from the German military to use their design for a rapidly deployable reconnaissance system. ESA then kicked in more funding to research and support the development of 100% reusable spacecraft. In 2022, Polaris rolled out a larger subscale platform called Aleda, which was 3.5 meters long, with modern flight control systems designed to operate in a negative stability mode. A hypersonic space plane will be aerodynamically unstable and will need constant computerized adjustment to maintain stable flight. Polaris has secured significant pre-Series A investment through its investment company, Polaris Space Venture. Polaris has also joined NATO's hypersonics working group and moved to a new facility in Bremen, Germany. With 400 square meters of office space and 550 square meters of workshop space. They also received an operating license for Athena. Athena has four jet engines and has been flying from the Rotenburg Airport near Bremen. Athena can be flown out of sight range. And the first flight of Athena was from the historic Punamunde Airport in November of 2022. But to make it into space, Polaris will need something other than turbojets. This is a video recently released on LinkedIn of the kerosene-powered aerospike engine being tested. And that brings us to Mira. Mira will be equipped with this aerospike engine and has been approved to fly from Pinamunde over the Baltic Sea, where it will have 260 square kilometers for testing. Here you see the Mira light without the aerospike engine being flown to fine-tune the flight software. If all goes well, Europe may soon have not just a hypersonic drone or point-to-point -point transport vehicle, but a fully reusable horizontal takeoff and landing space plane that will be intrinsically safer than Starship for carrying humans into space. Something to think about. Please don't forget to help us bring you more content by supporting us on Patreon, and we appreciate you. Stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.